So, hey everyone, um, welcome to the third day of Now Play This Festival. And I have to turn off the volume on the stream. Okay, now we're good. Uh, today, um, we'll be focusing on two games um, in a session that we call Games About Bad Actors. Um, so these are games that explore encounters with people and organizations that are directly implicated in pushing us further into the climate emergency. We have um, Villains and Heroes and The Last Survey. And um, both of these games, you can also play at home. You'll find instructions uh, on how to get them, how to access them in the program. But now I'm really excited to welcome the artists behind the games. Um, so Marlos, Marlos de Valk. Um, Marlos, you're a software artist, writer from the Netherlands, involved with open source, media art culture, and also the designer of Villains and Heroes. Welcome, Marlos. Thank you. <laughs> Good to hey. be here. And our second guest is Nicholas O'Brien. Um, Nicholas is a net-based artist, curator, writer, researching games, digital art, and network culture, um, currently living in Brooklyn and assistant professor in 3D design and game development at Stevens Institute of Technology. Hi, Nicholas, welcome to the stream. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, it's Hi. so good to be here. Great. Um, in the invisible virtual control room um, is now play this digital producer, Joe Summers. Hi, Joe. Who will, Hello. Be play hey Joe. <laughs> who will be playing both games while we talk about them. And because both of these games are text-based, we'll try a mode where um, I read out the text and Joe makes all the choices. So that's a kind of experiment today. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. It's also first time we're trying this. Um, and we're going to start uh, by playing Villains and Heroes, talk a little bit about how that goes, get a feel for the game, then we'll switch over to um, the last survey. And then we'll also have some time to kind of compare and have a discussion about both games, how, they, how they're alike in their approaches, how they're different also. Feel free to pop um, questions into the Twitch chat. Um, we will be kind of feeding in the questions as we go, uh, definitely towards the end, but if there's a, a good question you have right in the moment, we can also see how it, how it fits in. Cool, so yeah, let's start with, with Villains and Heroes. Let's, let's bring up the first screen of that. Cool, so here we are. This is the welcome screen of, of Villains and Heroes. Uh, let's try this thing. So I'm gonna read it and then I'm gonna ask you some questions. So Villains and Heroes, and it says, welcome to Villains and Heroes, an interactive fiction based on real events. Disclaimer, and here it gets interesting already, I think. None of the events and conversations in this story are real. The only facts are the location of the event and the guests present. The things they say and the rooms they are in are fictional. This story is a satire. Now, of course, I'm super curious now already what this is about, but maybe we dive in a little bit further before we, we reveal it, Marlos, what do you think? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So, well, Joe, your choice is pretty easy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so December 3, 2016. Saturday, the 3rd of December, 2016, Hedge fund billionaire Robert Mercer hosted the Mercer family's annual costume party at the Owl's Nest, Long Island, New York. Every year, the party has a different theme. This year's theme was Villains and Heroes. Past year's party had featured blackjack and poker tables. Guests were supplied with poker chips that could be traded in a luxurious prices, such as gold Rolexes, according to a political report. The press was not allowed to access, and the guests were asked to be discreet. Many people attended, but only 25 guests were confirmed. That's Robert Mercer, Rebecca Mercer, Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, Kellyanne Conway, Peter Thiel, Nigel Farage, Eric Prince, Joseph and Diane Bast, Brent and Norma Bozo, and a bunch of other people <laughs> that I would skip right now. But definitely an interesting crowd, I would say. Let's move on. What could possibly have happened there? Oh, you're in a Pikachu onesie. You're broke. Go survive another day. So why am I in a Pikachu onesie? Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, we just wanted to create the, this atmosphere of chilling at home and, uh, and uh, like, just like, I don't know. <laughs> Chill. <laughs> I feel already like I'm part of the I don't know, Burning Man subculture or something. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to another day of precarity. 
You're about to make yourself some coffee. When you hear something drop on the doormat, you walk up to the door and find a letter. So we have two options. You're curious and open the letter. You trash the letter, it's probably a bill. Cool, we're still home, still in Pikachu onesie, still broke. In the envelope is a card with sword yielding, with a sword yielding centurion slashing the head of a serpent haired Medusa. Dear friend, you are cordially invited to our annual costume party the 3rd December of 2016 at the Owl's Nest, Long Island. Demons, villains, and heroes, please come dressed as your favorite hero or villain. Please do not share any information about this event to the press. We appreciate your discretion. You will be awarded 10 poker chips at the start of the evening. If you play your cards right, you may be going home with a gold Rolex. Okay, so I have a goal. Can I actually get the Rolex? Yeah, you can. <laughs> okay, let's try this. Obviously, you, don't know, you do not know the Mercers personally. This must have been a mistake. Anyway, you're sure, uh, you sure could use some extra cash. That Rolex, hmm. okay, let's pick a costume and bullshit my way into this party. Okay, now we're in a place. And maybe now it's actually a good time to talk a little bit about what, like, what inspired you to make this game? What, what inspired me um, was actually my previous game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when I was working on What Remains, a uh, Nintendo uh, entertainment system game, I researched uh, the lobby of the tobacco industry in the 80s. And um, I, I, I was finding out so much about think tanks and lobby groups that were promoting, uh, yeah, basically uh, promoting tobacco and, and uh, spreading disinformation about it. Um, that, uh, that, that I was just fascinated and also like terrified at the same time. Like I had no idea that there was so much, so many different uh, think tanks and nonprofits, uh, yeah, basically pushing a very uh, strong industri industry agenda uh, and the way they were like opaquely uh, funded, that was just, um, yeah, really shocking. And then uh, what remains is also about uh, climate issues. And so I also started to look into how global warming uh, in the 80s, of course, was a known problem already. So I started looking at, at think tanks that were count, like spreading denial. And uh, yeah, that's how I got onto this trail of uh, looking into uh, this network of people because they're all mm -hmm. deeply involved in this. <laughs> yeah. And this is a, a real event, right? Like this party. Yeah. This, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a real event. The only thing that, well, yeah. So the event happened, uh, the guests were really there, but what happened at the party is all fictional and speculation because there were no journalists allowed. So th that was, uh, that was just my imagination. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's step into the party then. Okay, you pick up your phone and check out the costume website. Oh, it's already paid for and there's near instant delivery via an Amazon drone. What a time to be alive. The following costumes are still available. Friedrich Hayek, The Joker, Mother Teresa, Ayn Rand, Rosa Parks, and John Rockefeller. <laughs> okay, that's a big choice for you, John. <laughs> some some really some really weighted choices there. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm disguised as Mother Teresa. I have 40% capability to bullshit and I have zero Rolexes. I think we have to change that. Getting better at bullshitting people is my goal. Okay, awesome. You have a perfectly fitting camouflage. Your Uber driver looked a bit concerned, <laughs> probably worried about how Mother Teresa would rate the ride. These are tough times. You step out of the car in front of the gates of the Mercer Mansion. A few journalists are there. They're not allowed to enter. You approach the gate. The guards are very impressed with your Mother Teresa costume, yet they are not going to let you in that easily, it seems. Keep calm, don't panic. One of them casually asks, so, Mother Teresa, what brings you to the party? The options are, want to get fired? I'm a close friend of the family, you idiot. Or, I don't know, dude. I got the invitation by mistake. Yeah, I think that's a good choice. 
Okay, looks like we're in. Um, the guard looks ashamed and embarrassed. He quickly gestures to his colleague. Of course, of course, no problem, no problem at all. Please welcome Mother Teresa. Okay, so they fold over easily. Um, wow, that was easy. You managed to bullshit your way through this with great success. Your capability to bullshit got a 10 points increase. Uh, keep in mind that this is an essential skill to master when playing poker for Rolexes and for surviving in the mansion. Uh, to enter the mansion, you pass underneath a full marble entryway with the phrase Bono malem malum superate written on it. Oh, Jesus. What does that mean? <laughs> Bono malum. I don't yeah, know good bad. overcomes evil. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, and Mother Teresa is so good. Um, a hostess approaches you. Welcome. Please accept this mild gift from our host. This will allow you to participate in the small poker tournament. I wish you an excellent evening, Mother Teresa. You're given 10 poker chicks. Fantastic. I'm in. Yeah, cool. So it sounds like we're kind of um, in, a, in a sort of core game loop now or in some kind of uh, situation that's been set up. Um, is, is like, this is also maybe an, a point where it's interesting to discuss that you did add a kind of game mechanic here with this kind of counters going up, um, this kind of bullshitting index, like what were your considerations about um, I mean, choosing how to model this party? Well, um, I thought about it so long, like how, yeah. I, I, how I could do this in a way that, um, that you are basically, yeah, you're playing a rigged game. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. that you are you when you bullshit and you get better at it like it's it means that you well you, you already had to lie about things while being dressed as mother Teresa. i mean for a, a very ethical person this should already be a bit problematic so it's like yeah it you have to you have to play the game and all and at the same time you're you're paying with your uh, <laughs> with your morality basically <laughs> so it's a not a, it's it's a you're you're increasing points, but but at the same time, uh, you're you're not particularly winning or advancing on a on a grand scheme. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if we'll, we should, it will probably get clearer later on. Uh, I don't yeah. know how much I should like spoil. <laughs> no, let's play a little bit further. I mean, it's already what's clear to me is that it's really a very kind of light atmosphere that that you're making here, right? Like that there's this quite heavy group of people <laughs> right mm. but it's not like I, I don't feel like I'm you know in a like an attack piece or something I'm being sort of lured into this playful thing which I which I really like about this so um, I definitely want to play a little bit further so um, all right so nobody noticed you weren't supposed to be here good time to start exploring practice bullshitting to train your poker face and figure out where the poker tournament is held you're not going home without that gold Rolex you are alone. Okay. Okay. Only have access to the ballroom, I guess. So let's go over there. If you agree, Joe, of course. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the ballroom is a large space filled with tables carrying food and drinks. There's a small stage, perhaps for speeches. The walls are decorated with big clouds as if you're in heaven. Four men standing next to the stage talking to each other. And now I have a lot of options. I can talk to a white guy. Comte de Rochambeau, Superman, or another white guy. You have access to the entrance, kitchen, library, and balcony. So I'll leave that up to you, Joe. Hmm. Okay. Let's. I mean, I'm in, I'm intrigued by the fact that Superman's here. So let's try talking to Superman. <laughs> okay. Yep. That's Superman. Cool. So it's also the first kind of illustration that we get. Um, nice to meet you, Mother Teresa. I don't want to brag, but it was me who delivered one of the biggest caches of co uh, county votes in the nation for Trump. I've been involved in the campaign as a media surrogate too. I wouldn't mind doing this in 2020 again, work on the campaign. Uh, but first I continue as Suffolk County uh, GOP chairman. Did you see me on CNN, by the way? Oh, I love what you did on CNN. I must have missed it. I did. You were lying on national TV. Ah, interesting. So now suddenly I feel like it's it's more of a puzzle situation. Like I'm kind of wondering, you know, who is this person disguised as Superman? Um, I don't know. Joe, do you have an idea? Or uh, I mean, I'm all for like 
flirting with people at parties so let's be like over positive and and love what he did i think yeah that's probably the best <laughs> okay let's see the responses thanks that means a lot to me it was epic the host asked me about a trump tweet that said protesters outside his rally in new mexico tuesday night were thugs i creatively ad-libbed when I go to a Donald Trump rally, I see the American flags raised. When I go to a Hillary Clinton rally, I see people burning American flags and waving Mexican flags. The host wanted examples. Anyways, want to win a poker tournament. Oh, when did this come out actually? Like what, what was the situation <laughs> when you were writing this? Kind of? um, yeah, I was writing this in 2019. So uh, it was after a lot of stuff was already revealed and mm -hmm. a lot of it became clear that, um, yeah, that obviously uh, this guy lied. <laughs> there were no people burning American flags at Hillary Clinton rallies, mm -hmm. which was clear like right away anyways in this case. But uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the other characters, um, yeah, I could reveal things about them or hint at things that happened after the party. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like a... <laughs> chronological uh, chronologically not correct but but nice <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so okay here are the options you're roger kimball rob astorio john j laval how could i not know you spreader of fake news huh uh, yeah my my american politics is not amazing i could i could just you know bullshit and say of course i know who you are but i fear that you know i might get cross-examined on that Mm. Um. Oh, okay. Let's well, let's try it. I feel like it might be trouble though. Yeah. And we're supposed to bullshit, right? So. Yeah, there it. you go. Oh, he took off his mask. You cheeky little bastard, trying to bluff your way out, John J. Lavel in the flesh. I really fell in love with national politics this way. To participate directly in the election of a president—that's the Super Bowl of politics. Okay. Cool, and maybe let's check what happens when you go back. Oh, where this leads us, thanks. For... Yeah, exactly, okay. And then we can choose like other people. And let's see where, what our status is. We have 10 poker chips, 60% capability to bullshit, and we still have zero Rolexes. Interesting. You did get better at bullshitting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Maybe we try one more, one more room or one more person. Yeah, you're at sixty percent round now, right? Isn't that better than you were before? Yeah. I think so, I think so yeah. So, um, you know, for me, the best place in all of these parties is always the kitchen. So let's head over to the kitchen. Okay. The kitchen is steaming hot. It's hard to imagine anyone wanting to stay here, but somehow four guests are standing around the stove, admiringly observing the steam escaping from big pans of soup. You can talk to an Asian guy, a British Barbie, a prisoner with the word denier on his back, or Obi-Wan Kenobi. You have access to ballroom and broom closet. That's, that's hard. Um, Phil, as, as you know, with my uh, current location, a British Bobby would be uh, appropriate, but then it is very <laughs> tempting to also talk to Obi-Wan Kenobi. So um, let's, let's go with the police officer. Okay. Okay. Uh, the... Okay, he says, come join us at the stove, Mother Teresa. Nothing relaxes me more than watching things slowly simmer. I needed that after editing or writing more than 160 studies and 20 books on state, state and local public policy, including all volumes in the Climate Change Reconsidered series produced by Heartland for the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. Looks exhausted. Me and Joseph worked for Heartland since the, since the 80s and we were its first employees. Joseph was only 26 with nothing but a high school diploma Yet he wrote or edited 21 books on topics such as global warming, smoking, education, and healthcare. And I'm kind of assuming that this stuff is now real again, right? Or like yeah, the, it is. Like yeah. I, mo most of the dialogue is mm -hmm. based on on real um, uh, on real things. Like yeah, this person actually did that. She did edit 160 studies. 
Um, and uh, yeah, her husband uh, with a high, nothing but a high school school diploma wrote and edited 21 books on global warming and smoking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's Can I interesting. ask a question or like, um, sure. I'm curious about like your writing process with this, right? Like, cause you're, you are setting up this situation where for me, when I read this, it makes me want to go to the internet and then like, mm. like research, like who this person is. And I'm yeah. wondering like, how intentional that design was for you or like you know like this kind of back and forth between this like fact and fiction and yeah mm. yeah of course i'm i'm hoping that everything will trigger people to become curious about looking up these people and 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 that's why i also included a, a references at the bottom where you can check where i got all the information from and take it from there um yeah because uh, it is really like it's also astonishing and it's not well very well known not not all of it totally totally mm. ah, cool. so you can kind of go into the references also from from the game directly uh yes cool maybe let's do that let's just have a, have a look so it's like at the very bottom yeah let's have a, let's, let's oh i hope i didn't just like i actually no, I haven't played it for so long that I don't know how we get back to the party from here. I think, I think it works. I, I think I did it once when. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh, interesting. So there's, uh, let's scroll down. So there's something about the guest list. Like, are these articles kind of about the party and what? Yeah, those are the guest lists were like where, uh, like, so how I how I uh, put together this list. And uh, all of them were revealed in these articles that I list here, except one I identified from a photo that was leaked on a the Atlanta Buzz blog, and they later removed the photos because it was uh, probably someone started to complain, but I downloaded them. And just I so, so this is really extensive. So to each, like for each participant in this party, you have like a whole list of, of sources, basically. Yeah. To me, this changes the atmosphere also a lot. Like it becomes much more journalistic in a way also in this in this game. Yeah. Like you're sort of going through a, someone's research system. I think it's really interesting. Mm. Um, were you ever concerned, like were you concerned about interactions with these people or did you have any? No, I game? didn't have any. Uh, I did I did think about like contacting, mm -hmm. I, I, I tried to contact a few um, people uh, to ask about other guests because I at first I really wanted because probably there were like uh, over a hundred people, maybe two hundred people there. So uh, I thought I could maybe like extend uh, the guests uh, guest list a lot, but nobody obviously <laughs> nobody replied to me mm -hmm. because yeah the 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 host explicitly asked everyone to be discreet about this party. And um, by the time I started this research, he was also getting quite some negative publicity. So he was uh, really not looking for attention. Um, and yeah, of course, I was worried about uh, getting his attention because there are some guests that are very happily litigating anyone <laughs> who uh, criticizes their um, uh, them. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it was um, sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So I think to get to get back to the game, we just have to go all the way to the bottom of the page. Um, yeah, but I think then we have to quickly skip through the start again. I'm really sorry. I uh, no, I got no, us I, into. I, uh... I, I, try, I tried this. You can do a restart, um, but then um, it it goes where you were. Yeah, and then we can oh, take back to the game. Yeah, yeah. So I forgot right I did that. Yeah. 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 Oh wow! <laughs> I thought of everything. Oh. <laughs> so maybe. Um, one more question um, before we switch to the other game and then go deeper. So um, I'm curious about the kind of choice of role of the player um, in this. Um, I mean, it's very kind of abstract. There's no backstory or anything. There's nothing. Um, I, I wonder like how you made this decision to put someone who's kind of totally unconnected, unimplicated, <laughs> has, yeah. a, has the costume just kind of into the situation. Yeah. Yeah, I um, it because that's how I felt when I was researching mm. this. I feel like this these people are from a world that is so completely disconnected from mine. I am so not implicated in their world, but I do feel that they have an insane amount of influence on my world because they are um, through their financial power can influence politics. And it's 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 this like this is about America, but it's the same in Europe and and where I live in the Netherlands. There is lobbies that have so much power, 
uh, and and this power is bought and so if you're not wealthy <laughs> like me <laughs> i don't have that power so and it, but they have power over what happens to 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 my world and especially when you talk about climate change this is so important so i felt like as a player your agency i wanted to be the same kind of agency that you have like that is not too far away from real life you know like um what we can do is, is is vote for people that hopefully will stop this lobby that's the kind of you know and bring this to the attention of politicians and policy makers but but we we can't sneak into a party and change and save the world so this game is also not putting you in such a position where you can save the world uh, jump out of your pikachu onesie and and and, and save the planet unfortunately mm -hmm. um and but but you know in politics what we hear a lot and also what is like uh pushed a lot uh uh by uh, uh lobbyists and think tanks is that it is my responsibility that the climate is uh, changing that i should buy green, green products and be a green consumer and stop flying so often and it's my responsibility and actually this kind of uh, this kind of um, this system of buying influence by wealthy elites that have everything to gain from business staying as as it is so business as usual and maintaining that that's um, yeah that's that's what I want to communicate with the uh -huh. game and uh, hopefully trigger trigger people to to also be upset about that <laughs> I'm still very curious about the poker game. Is, is there a, a good, can we jump somehow into the poker game from here? Or how, do, how, does, it, how does that? Well, you have to, you really have to bullshit enough. So you, every okay. time you mm -hmm. bullshit successfully, you're, you're get, gaining 10% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and you have enough poker chips. So you can also win poker chips if you guess the identity right. But I guess if you want to quickly advance to the poker game, you have to like bullshit successfully, which is quite easy because I didn't make it too hard. Like yeah. the, the answers yeah. are quite obvious. Uh, <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, don't know if you, if, if you wanna try that, uh, Joe. I think, it's, I think it's fine for now. I, I feel like mm. we've gotten like a good taste kind of the game. So there's kind of this intro exploration part of the game. And then what, what happens during the, during the poker game? Is there like an... Um, yeah, during, during the poker, it's uh, like you have to, you're playing against uh, two pros mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, you're getting really, really um, some tough choices. You have to choose what, uh, how much uh, chips you want to bet. But if you play your cards right, you win. And then uh, you have your Rolex and then the host of the party wants to have a little one-on-one -on -one with you. And uh, and then uh, that's the that's the end of the game. After you spoke to him and you make your final decision about what he proposes to you, that's it. Then uh, that's the end of the game. I don't want to to, to spoil it for yeah. those who are yeah. curious now and want to to play sure, it. <laughs> exactly. And and it's also so great that it's just um, available in a, in a browser, so everyone can just immediately uh, jump in and play it right now. Um, yeah. Super. Yeah, I'm curious if any of the people on the list. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> actually yeah they're kind of googling their name uh, as i imagine they have some <laughs> some person I, do for them i would speculate that they haven't but like their assistants right. or like their publicists or like their whatever minions if you will like have because mm -hmm. like in my experience like when you kind of operate at like that level right and maybe i'll talk about this a little bit but like when you experience when you're at that level like you don't really like care about the day to day, right? You're not like sitting at your computer being like, oh, let me check out this interactive, you know, like yeah. you, that information never like actually gets filtered up to you. So I, I, I would like, I don't want to say for sure or for not, but I, I would like imagine that somebody in their orbit has like, you mm. know, that works for them definitely has like seen it and been like should we litigate or like what should we do something about this right. or like see if this is this person and then it's like but i i don't i don't know like that's i think just this is so niche that nobody will care right right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well you never know i mean that is i like i think it's brave because like to me i would feel very scared doing this kind of uh, game naming names being so clear about the sources and not kind of disguising it in some kind of allegory or something like that like i think it's really really impressive yeah. well yeah let's see <laughs> <laughs> if 
<laughs> you never hear from me again. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. I did. I did ask a, a lawyer for advice uh -huh. before releasing it, and um, yeah, and, it, and there's always a risk, of course. And uh, but I think that uh, yeah, there's so much uh, like um, um, uh, like I don't know, just there's so much effort put on um, into blaming uh, individuals right. like you and me, and about blaming even uh, elementary particles like CO2. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, really, I mean, seriously, that's uh -huh. like, a, that, it's like, it's really clever to say like it's CO2 and to say, no, no, it's, it's burning fossil fuels. That's the cause, not CO2. Like, it's really nice to shift mm -hmm. uh, the attention and it, as the like, okay, I'm going to not do that and then just take the risk. <laughs> yeah. And did you change anything about the game and the conversation with the lawyer or? Um, a, kind of well, open? definitely this disclaimer uh, was mm -hmm. an addition after mm -hmm. speaking to the lawyer because mm -hmm. yeah, it is a satire and satires are uh, allowed. <laughs> you can, you can put public figures, you know, and uh, I, I, all of these people are public figures. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you want to make a satire about them, it's, it's, it's allowed. Right. And the, uh, the costume um, choices, like the how people are disguised, is that mm. real or partially? Yeah, real? yeah, it's real. Everyone mm -hmm. I could figure out uh, mm -hmm. based on the articles I uh, found, uh, they're, they're really like mentioned the, the disguises, like the prisoner mm -hmm. with the word denier and Superman. Mm -hmm. uh, but the people I didn't know, uh, they are all white guys, um, mm -hmm. or one Asian guy. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. That that was really interesting. I think that's also a good point, maybe to shift. Um, so we also have time to come back, maybe to a more like comparative uh, discussion of both games. Um, so thanks a lot, Marlos, for um, showing us that. And let's uh, switch over to um, the last survey. Just catching up with the stream to make sure, but I think I think I could hear Lewis's soundtrack over there. There we go. Cool. And. Exactly, and we thought it would make sense to um, maybe start off, or, or you, you wanted to start by giving a little bit of background info before we play for this one, right? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Seb. Um, I just want to start my introduction of the last survey with an acknowledgement and dedication to the people of uh, Rumdinho and Mariana uh, that directly suffered as a result of the negligence and the oversights of the hands of Vale, which is like the company that this is loosely based on. Uh, I'd also like to kind of like, um, acknowledge too that the industry depicted in the last survey, which is like a global mining empire, is directly responsible for the desecration and pilfering of countless indigenous lands and sacred sites and causing reckless trauma that will undoubtedly last generations. So I think as we play through this, I would really like to keep those people in mind um, and to kind of take a collective moment uh, to just kind of acknowledge them. Um, so thank you for that. And I appreciate that moment. Um, so the last survey is an essay video game, and I'm happy to talk about that in a second, that explores a speculative future where the metals and use the metals that we use for electronics and green technology are in sudden short supply. Uh, you play as a contracted geologist who's recently completed a survey for a global mining company and have returned to deliver your news to uh, the research or your research to the company CEO, Victor Ferreria. Uh, the last survey asks players to make pivotal choices in order to steer the conversation toward progressive action. Uh, so this game is like based on studies by nickel and silver prospectors, geoscientists, and mineral analysts, and their findings have recently shown uh, that, that there actually isn't enough mineral material on the planet to sustain the current rate of electric car, high, high efficiency fuel cells, and solar paneling manufacturing, and a lot of other like supplementary green technology and also just like digital technology that we use every day. Um, so this scenario, the last survey, uh, which could be called like uh, an exploration of peak mineral is similar to like current worries and woes that we have surrounding non-renewable energy sources like oil. Uh, though like, you know, our imminent collapse or the imminent collapse depicted in this um, is kind of a ways off. I wanted to think about what the decision-making of someone like Victor would look like if we were suddenly foisted into uh, this kind of major planetary decision, you know, with major stakeholders, right, in this industry. Um, so yeah, also important thing to notice, like the story is uh, loosely, or this game <laughs> is loosely based on um, a former Vale CEO, Fabio Schwarzman, 
uh, and my own personal experiences with executive level uh, ideologues, I would say. Uh, your conversation with Victor is as much a portrait of men in power as it is a reaction uh, or reflection on what it means to be culpable within an oppressive system beyond your control, which I think actually kind of speaks a little bit to what um, Malos was talking about too. Um, the game is divided into four chapters and I don't know how far we'll get, um, but it's illustrated by hundreds of hand-drawn digital graphite and charcoal animations. Uh, and it, based on player choices, the narrative animations and dynamic soundtrack comp composed by Louis Kopenhoffer will vary. Um, so you, you're supposed to be cautious, which we'll get a warning from in just one yeah. second. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, cool. That's that's my little spiel and intro about this. Thanks. For great. Let's that. let's dive in and and uh, also because you mentioned the music, I think it's great to to turn that back up, um, Joe, so people on the stream can hear it. Uh, maybe we can talk about that also a little bit later. Um, I think it's quite quite interesting feature actually. Right? Great. Yeah. Let's start. Yeah, if you see this icon, your patience is running low, try slowing down. Okay, I will start slow. I, I, I doubt that we'll have this problem in, in this format. Uh, yeah, and I'll, <laughs> yeah, but if you do happen to see that icon, yeah. So for the past year, I've been collecting data, and now my survey is done. Wow, I'm just watching the animation at the top for a reason. Okay, so just interesting. So it doesn't loop and just kind of some just switch, right? Um, cool. So I've been I've been to Sudbury in the north and Nomea in the Pacific, Solobo in the jungle, and the desolate desert surrounding Mount Keep. I've seen the raw ore ripped from the earth, open pits ablaze, Vertkin surface extractors chugging diesel and the burning glow of mountain opportunity. Is that a Vertkin surface extractor that we're looking at there? Yeah, that, that actually is indeed uh -huh. what we are looking at. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, let's move on. The deafening sound of the world eating itself rings loud in my ears, but now I'm back returning from my research to share what I've heard. I arrived at the last stop of my tour, the corporate headquarters of my employer, awaiting my scheduled meeting with Victor Ferreira. So it's already interesting to me that it's actually kind of similar vibe of like coming to a place of power and kind of this approach uh, in, in both games and like being a little bit anxious maybe about what's going to happen in, these, in this meeting. Um, yeah, let's move on. I took the elevator from the sheer glass and white concrete lobby up to the executive offices on the 19th floor. I've only been up here once before to celebrate a divided payoff last year on the terrace looking over Guadalajara Bay. Interesting. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the, the animations actually, um, yeah, because totally. they're so kind of um, distinct in their in their style here. Like, what what like what was your approach in, in making these or? It's a, it's a huge amount also, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I tried to be as economical as possible with the animation style. That's why each one of the transitions only happens once, and then you kind of have this like cycling back and forth between um, that kind of one freeze frame. Uh, but yeah, the animation style was, um, was something that I kind of like arrived at somewhat early. Um, a lot of my previous work or a lot of my games are usually in like 3D animation. Uh, of one kind or another. And I started with that in this project or I prototyped this project as a 3D uh, environment that you're navigating through. Um, but to me, it became really important that I actually wanted to kind of think about the relationship between the visual material and the uh, like written material. Cause you're kind of talking about like uh, this like very like hands in the ground uh, trade, right? This very like uh, tactile, um, material uh, world and so to me just like having a 3D environment felt so like kind of alienating or, or not alienating exactly but felt so distant from that 
So um, I started to reincorporate some hand-drawn animations uh, that were in charcoal. Uh, and then I kind of, through play testing, people said like, oh, the charcoal is so beautiful and so interesting, but you like kind of reveal that too quickly. So I kind of went back and uh, decided to kind of do a similar process with um, uh, digital drawings at first, and then that kind of veers into graphite and then eventually into the charcoal. Um, so yeah, so it was kind of this intention for me to really think about the visuals as being this material connection to the content of the work, yeah. And this kind of shifting between those two scenes was like a way that I felt like uh, you could still have some of that alienating or destabilizing feel that was happening in the digital animations uh, or in the digital renderings, um, but to still have these kind of like isolated moments. Or, yeah, let's, let's maybe move on a few more um, steps in the game. Uh, Joe, if you would, thanks. Oh, okay, this is new. Okay, it was a lovely view, but a somewhat bittersweet evening. I couldn't help but feel like the festivities were rehearsal for the end of days. Champagne and caipirinha were raised and drained in seemingly endless succession. But eventually, the well went dry, a fitting symbol of mining operations across the globe. They were all beaming that night. It's nothing but tight lips these days. It's interesting how there's all, also here, funnily, I'm just collecting stuff, I'm noticing between the two games, a kind of description of party um, while actually kind of not really visualizing the masses or this kind of thing around, like a kind of party in your mind. It's interesting to me. Now I'm summoned again to the top fours, not to rejoice, this time it's panic. The office was eerily calm. I suppose these top floor types have perfected the nonchalant alarm necessary to command companies whose stock prices determine the economic success of entire nations. Um, yeah, let's move on one more. An executive assistant sat me in a designer recliner in a plush waiting area, cordoned off by sheets of clear glass. And maybe this is a good moment also to talk a little bit of, about the music, which is kind of related also to the to the drawings and kind of goes to me. It feels like it's three tracks basically of a composition, like the the writing, the the music, and the and the art, kind of going back and forth. Um, you want to talk about the approach to the music or how how you arrived at this? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, I'm just extremely indebted to Louis Kopenhofer who wrote the score for this project. Um, he's an incredible musician and instrumentalist based in Los Angeles. And um, he actually kind of came into the project quite late in the process. Um, I was collaborating with some other people uh, prior to this and that we were doing kind of live performances and, and um, just kind of as a result of schedule conflict, they kind of had to bow out of the project. But Louis was recommended to me by uh, another artist friend as somebody that would be really a great collaborator. And it was just this amazing process of working with him uh, where I kind of would like give him these tonal notes or I gave him the script and he came back with, you know, sketches that were uh, using um, modified uh, mallet instruments and a modified roads that he had. Um, and he, you know, he kind of knew that the tone was this like somber and serious and uh, quite atmospheric, um, uh, space and so he kind of sent me notes and I would be like oh yeah this but like darker or like this but like more eerie and um but yeah it, the process was this just amazing back and forth with him and and yeah I think that like the project is like so elevated as a result of his contribution absolutely and it must have been tricky to organize these loops so that it kind of adjusts to your reading tempo so right I mean it's like it, yeah. it never feels like it breaks but somehow it still like changes when you when you move along. Yeah, I mean, we're, we'll see that in just a second. Like we're kind of still in the first central loop of the game. And um, I used, uh, um, yeah, we, we kind of, that was very intentional in the design too, is to try to make something that would be seamless. And that was like a really difficult thing to do at, for a certain um, motion, uh, you know, for certain kind of moments in the, in the game. But uh, again, Lewis was just like very, very conscientious of the fact and, um, you know, made sure that the work that he was designing uh, could be, you know, loopable and adjustable. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So maybe let's let's move uh, like two or three more steps ahead. Um, yeah. Aha, first choice. They asked me if I'd like anything before meeting with um, Senor Ferreira. Um, so a cappuccino, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, or or water. So Joe, what do you, what do you prefer? I would have preferred something a bit stronger, but over the years I've grown distrustful of any office made espresso, so I stuck with something sim simple. I didn't sleep well last night knowing I'd be coming here to deliver my recent round of research. Not in fear of any consequences, just more worried what it might mean for those working in our facilities in Voices Bay or, and our joint ventures in the Kola Peninsula. Uh, that's a cool animation, I think. Uh, my drink arrived in an unexpected, uh, timely fashion, delivered by a new stranger, someone I assumed to be a subordinate of my initial greeter. This individual is probably the assistant to the exec executive assistant or perhaps the junior executive assistant. Either way, they smile cheaply and pass me the ceramic cup and saucer with steady hands. Yeah, so maybe we can talk a little bit about, about, about the writing also um, because I feel like it's, it's interesting how it's a lot about these kind of details of um, uh, like, I don't know how the cup feels or how the, how the building looks and things like that. And then kind of goes back and forth like, um, did, did, was that like clear from the start for you that, that you'd like focus on these things or did you try different approaches? Yeah, totally. And that's a great question. Um, the piece actually started as a piece of writing. Um, a lot of my work usually starts with writing, um, whether it's like an animation or, or a game. Um, and I, I try to use writing as a way of like really filling out the world um, before like really thinking about visuals or soundtrack or, or even like gameplay. Um, so the way that I first like tried to design this game was really thinking about like adding those details and really trying to show the scale and the scope of like this organization and like what global mining supply chains like, you know, look like. They're just like these massive behemoth billions and billions of dollar industries and I wanted to impress that upon the audience like very clear from the get-go that um, the scale of this is quite daunting and um, and that, that that kind of triggers a little bit in the in this character this sense of like anxiousness and and uh, worry that then manifest in a, a couple of different ways further into the game um, but yeah the writing for me uh, was really important to have these kind of rich details early on um, to give a sense of the scope of you know what you're about to endeavor upon, but also to to really put the player in the mindset of, of someone that was acutely aware of their kind of relationship or their smallness, if you will, like amidst uh, something so massive. Yeah, and it's interesting because this is also a point where there's like a really big difference also between both of your styles here that you chose or like the strategy employed. Well, I mean, I think it's. It's interesting that in um, Villains and Heroes, it's like, I have no fear. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it's all about, and you know, I feel really empowered to just go in and, you know, uncover these, <laughs> these dudes basically, right? And yeah. see what they're up to. And here it's more about, you know, ah, I, you know, I feel scared uh, or in an awe or I don't know, like I'm nervous. Um, so that's interesting how it's like two paths, I guess, to, to deal with power or to, to work power into, into a game, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to note that too. I, I would love to keep going, but I was going to note that too, that like uh, in early play testing, people got to the point of choosing between a cafe, like a cafezinho and, and the water. And they were like, man, I really don't want to choose wrong here. Uh, <laughs> and that choice is really just introducing the, the choice mechanic. There's like not a consequence really that's happening there. But I, I thought that that was like so interesting. I was like, whoa, I made people really nervous really quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
core. Let's go like two or three steps more. I could peer through the maze-like interior to spy on the other near-identical waiting areas of other company dignitaries. Though similarly adorned and fashioned, this antechamber was slightly larger. Further down the hallway, there was also a scattering of meeting rooms concealed by drawn blinds. The rooms looked empty at the moment, but they had undoubtedly been buzzing with recent activity. The blinds still swayed slightly from the leftover breeze created from suits quickly being buttoned after a swift round of decision making. I considered how many decisions had been made on this floor sealing the fate of thousands of workers from Mozambique and New Caledonia. Yeah, and here I think the, the music does a lot, actually. You can kind of hear it through the stream. Their faces flashed before me, stark, hard eyes beneath layers of earth and grease. Um, and now I have two choices. The strip miners in uh, Sorovaku wore reflective UV sunglasses, or I remember the rail yard workers in on, uh, Onka Puma. So which one do you remember, Joe? It was rare to look them directly in the eyes. Distant stars, stares were a common punctuation of the protracted conversations between technicians. And that's a nice car. <laughs> Big truck. Big truck. I mean, that's also an interesting choice, right? That there's relatively few people, right? In the drawings also kind of, that's a very cold sort of technical atmosphere that you're going for there. Or is the, yeah. is the kind of main antagonist the only character that you see or? There, I, I think, I was actually just thinking about that. The, 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 yeah, the antagonist is really the only figure that you see that has any detail. Um, you see a couple of moments of other individuals, but they are either like purposely generic or like lacking any kind of identification. Um, so yeah, so you see Victor. Yeah, yeah. So as a way of answering that, the only person that you ever recognize is Victor um, uh, as a very kind of deliberate design choice, you know, that this is like yeah. Victor's world, right? Yeah. So maybe this is good um, to give a little bit of a uh, like a preview of what's going to happen next or where this is leading because I don't think we have time to go a lot further in yeah but totally. maybe you can give kind of a, a feel for what's what's going to happen without spoiling too much maybe yeah totally absolutely um yeah this kind of prologue this first chapter is really just trying to set up that atmosphere and, mm -hmm. and it kind of leads you to this moment of basically being ushered into uh, Victor's office um so yeah the, the whole game then kind of from there on in kind of centers around this conversation um and this kind of plea, if you will, uh, that you are trying to deliver to Victor about this research that you've been doing for the past year. Um, the kind of interspersed throughout that is this internal monologue, uh, also that the main character at, or, and or you are having about like your own culpability within the system and like, uh, like kind of trying to reconcile in one way, whether or not like you have the authority or the agency to really like affect change. Um, since you know you are the kind of keeper of this research and you are the 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 how can you say the custodian in a certain way of like the, these findings and trying to really wrestle with whether or not you're just an employee within you know this network or a contracted individual or if you have like you know more agency or, or more uh, opportunity to actually affect some kind of progressive change um but through that, you know, trying to wrestle between those two poles, these two kind of uh, um, decisions is also trying to placate Victor's fickleness and his indecisiveness and his you know, selfishness, right? Or his like desire to um, do what's best for his shareholders. So you're also trying to like advance as best as you can through the conversation. 
Um, so if you act too aggressively or if you act too off the cuff or if you act too uh, indignant towards Victor's position, then you'll kind of be asked to leave prematurely uh, and you came over. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think that kind of is a good way of establishing uh, what else happens in the game without spoiling it too much. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess I will say that like that threshold, unlike in uh, Marlowe's uh, game, is like that threshold is actually quite thin. So um, I think that I found that at least by watching people play it, that um, people tend to game over like uh, pretty easily, and that's that's somewhat intentional. Mm -hmm. Cool. So maybe this is a good moment also to um, go into kind of more general discussion or something uh, with both of the games and. Um, Joe, we can maybe also switch back to the uh, to the other view. Um, I think what's really striking also when we were thinking about this um, kind of constellation for conversation is this, yeah, basically choice of using text also. Or maybe I, that, that would be a cool thing to start talking about together. Maybe like, what do you both of you think is kind of the potential of, of text-based games in, in this kind of spirit of maybe attacking uh, people who are implicated in, in advancing the climate crisis. Like it's, it's like, it's interesting that you've both chosen text, right, to do that. And I'm wondering like what the pros and cons are of, of that approach or maybe Marlos, you can, you can start. Um, yeah, wow, that's a very good question. <laughs> I was actually, you know, I was thinking in the other way, in the other direction. I was in, initially thinking I'm going to write about this and then I thought, no, I can't, um, I can't uh, communicate what I want to communicate in an essay. It has to be uh, interactive. It has to be like, a, it has to have game elements. Otherwise, uh, the whole of putting someone in the thick of a situation and letting them get as lost as me when I was researching in this network of, of people, it's not communicatable in a text. So, so uh, yeah, for me, it started with text and it, it moved to a game instead of uh, thinking I'm going to make a game and I'm going to choose text. <laughs> what it. about so you, Nicholas? Yeah, yeah I'm, that's so interesting because I think like, uh, like I, I talk about this game as an essay and that's like a kind of a larger project of, of like mine is thinking about like essay games, like using that same kind of um, methodology of writing, like research-based, uh, you know, with a specific point or a specific message at the end of it, um, or even a specific argument, right? Like theses um, mm. as like part of the central kind of focus of the writing. Um, and I, I similarly felt too that like, even just like the introduction of choice was like so interesting and valuable to me um, and really thinking about like how agency plays a role um, within like a participants, uh, like, absorption of this content, I think it's just like super, was really valuable for me. And I similarly felt that way where I was just like, yeah, you could just kind of write a critical essay about like how these systems are flawed or or write some speculative future that's about, you know, like this moment or this moment that's gonna happen. Um, but to me, it became really important to have like that like insertion, right? That like that uh, imagination or that embodiment or whatever you wanna call it. Uh, be it an element of how players then or how audiences like then interpret right that uh, mm. material. Yeah, yeah, and I would like to add also um, that uh, in the, my previous game, what remains, uh, I wanted to communicate similar things, but and it was made with a team, by the way. And um, but then uh, you can, it was a Nintendo game for the like an eight bit game, <laughs> so we had very minimal resources, and you can only use so little actual text, you can communicate so little in terms of information that this was like, this felt like a, like a liberation in a sense, like it was much better fit with the research, like, uh, like you also mentioned, Nicholas. Yeah, so it seems like there's kind of by augmenting the text, um, like the, I guess the play around the text, both of you are trying to like keep the strength of the text also, I guess, in, in play, right? Like the kind of detailedness or the, the amount of uh, information, the information density or something in, mm. in the text is kind of still there. I think that's, that's really interesting that you would maybe lose that if it, this was kind of more a game that involved a lot more running around or looking at beautifully designed environments or something like that, then you kind of, okay, the competition is stronger with the text. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, at the same time, Ah, 
Twitch, is there any questions also? I'm, I think I also want to make sure that I'm not missing tons of questions. So if you're on Twitch watching this, please please do ask questions. Now's a great, great moment also to, to jump in. Um, like another question I had maybe for you both is, um, I guess this kind of centering the text in the experience does kind of also limit, um, I guess, interactivity or agency compared to other types of, of game mechanics, right? And in and, and both, that's also kind of tied to the story or to, to the situation, right? So I'm wondering like if this sort of frustration with agency or something is something you were both like really interested in or um, how you think kind of, you know, criticism in general through, through games towards power, you know, can be expressed. So maybe... Do, do you want, Marlos, do you want oh, to take that I one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's a really difficult question, I think. Yeah. I mean, um, um, I mean, well, I think in 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 general, like uh, if I compare it to my, to my previous games, um, yeah, there was already like uh, I already have a lot of uh, issues with the the hero uh, idea of the hero and uh, mm. the winning. <laughs> mm. um, so uh, in that sense, that this is like. Um, a more flat situation like you you can't really win you can't you can end the game but then you have to kind of make sacrifices and and you can also but you can also be really true to yourself and get kicked out and um and and just leave it at that because then you kind of already know what i want to communicate so that's also okay <laughs> there's acceptance there <laughs> so i think that yeah this uh th this is this is a, something that I think is a strength, but it can also be implemented in other types of games. I don't see it as a particularly necessarily related to text-based games. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, so, that question. Oh, sorry. Did you? I no, go ahead. Question. I was just going to say, like, that question of agency is definitely on my mind, um, and it's something that I I feel like I actually got some a little bit of like pushback uh, on when I first released the project in a kind of wider general audience that people are like. I can't tell if my choices matter in this game, um, or I can't tell like where you know, like where I, what choices I can make to like win, you know. And I think to me, I was like, you're kind of missing the point a little bit, maybe, uh, or like maybe you're you're um, skimming over the fact that the, the the choices in this game aren't about like winning a conversation, right? Mm. But really trying to like explore the social, political, and emotional space of these conversations, right? Um, and these debates, right, that happen um, around this material. So to me, like, I think that trying to leverage agency was a way of, of discussing where nuance can be within like game design. And I think that text is like a great place for that, or like writing is a great place uh, for nuance to occur. And I, I just didn't have uh, a more, you know, I, maybe I'm, I'm not just as good a visual designer to know where that nuance is uh, or know how to like execute that nuance in other ways. But yeah, I, I think that that's, that question, Seb, is like super close to the design thinking around uh, the last survey for sure. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Right, no, I just wanted to say that I think uh, it also has a lot to do with uh, what kind of expectations you raise when you, before you, totally. the player starts. And I think your choice to sort of call this essay games is really clever that way. There's no confusion about mm -hmm. what it is. I really like that. I would have thought that, but there was so oh. confusion. <laughs> but no, I, I, I totally agree with you that like those trying to set that stage is really, really important. And I mm. think like, making sure that a player knows like what they're getting into before they get into it is is really um yeah worthwhile and i and i think like if i were to reflect on the last survey and some of the flaws of it i would have done a lot more to set that up beforehand um and yeah so you're totally right so here's a pretty good question from the chat i think that that builds on that um how much does the idea of empathy for these bad actor characters come into the design of your games uh, this is for both um like, do you, are you supposed to kind of feel with them, um, like with these Trump people or, or, or with the oh. mining boss? Shall I, uh, shall I go first? Sure, sure, go first, please. Um, well, I think that empathy, I don't know if that's the right word, 
but I def definitely what I got while researching really strongly was that um, that they're not there is no there are no heroes and villains like there is they're, they're not the villains either because they're just pursuing a, a very specific agenda and it's and they're doing it often in a very clumsy way as well and they get they get they get like uh, outed for doing things that are not allowed or for you know. Um, uh, playing back channels and whatnot and so so it, you do get I don't know I guess it's empathy that like you you feel like oh my god this is such a mess on on all sides you know um, but um, not empathy in the sense of oh the oh poor 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 people <laughs> yeah I, I think that yeah I agree with you I, I wouldn't say that it's exactly empathy um, but trying to understand agendas right and trying mm. to understand intentions I think that that's definitely something that is happening in, in the last survey. Cause I think like empathy would, would mean that then like you don't blame Victor, right? And I think that you should blame Victor in a certain way but you should also understand Victor's intentions. And, and I think that if you politically or morally disagree with them you should at least know like where they're coming from. Cause mm -hmm. I think that it's become so easy to just like write them off like kind of uh, as de facto bad, right? Um, and instead kind of think about in, in like what, like why, instead of being like who being like why, right? Um, yeah. I guess it's like maybe some of the, the writing intention. But I think the other thing that I like would, would say to that too is, is that like, it's not just those people, or I guess like a lot of my games are interested about like decision-making from people in power, right? And like, there's conversations and there's dictations and there's meetings and there's bureaucracy and there's shareholders and there's all these different stakeholders at play with how the world gets shaped. And I'm kind of distilling it into this like one figure, but that one figure is in some ways a straw man for a whole system that's so opaque, right? Or mm -hmm. yeah, so like hard to intersect with as like an individual not immersed in those systems. So then like, how do you deal with them? How do you like begin to unpack them? How do you critique them without being an insider? And, and so I think that that is more where the empathy maybe is happening is, is like thinking about how do you even begin to tackle something so massive and beyond your control? Mm. Yeah, I think that's it's the same for me, at least I mm. feel that it's, it's more pointing the finger to the a power asymmetry and the asymmetry mm. in the democratic systems like the, the that it's it's legal to have a non-profit organization that takes millions of dollars and then funnel it towards a political end and that's allowed and so you know and and the the, the characters in my game are are not, not i don't know if you can say abuse or use this system i mean i would say it's it's they're playing the game according to the rules <laughs> right um but you know the game is rigged <laughs> this is a, a flaw in uh, in 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 the system yeah so but i mean when you describe it as a game like that also i was curious of both of you actually if if you also considered kind of the opposite approach would be be put the player in this position of power, right? Like, I mean, there's also this kind of satirical way to, to deal with power is to like allow allow someone to feel it <laughs> in yeah. order to kind of deconstruct how it works or yeah. you know, um, that side. Like, I, I wonder if that's like also cool in another project or if it's like a deliberate choice for both of you to say, no, like we specifically want to like put the, the player in a position outside of this to sort of attack the, the power. I think for me, um, so many games, like so many AAA games and like mainstream games are about being a single individual that shapes the universe, right? Like mm -hmm. whether it's like Halo or whether it's, I don't know, like other huge big budget franchises like Dark Souls or something like that. Like all those games are about the single individual shaping the universe. And to me, I find that to be like such a narrow bandwidth to think about what interactivity can be. So um, to me, I was like, I don't wanna be Victor um, mostly because I don't want there to be a moment of that empathy, maybe that was to bring that in before, mm -hmm. but also like we have so many games that are about like rich, powerful, mm -hmm. all, you know, knowing, you know, all controlling individuals. So to me, I was like, oh, let's like actually tell it from this other perspective where you kind of have soft power where you're uh, a person that could potentially shape something, but you need to be very careful with, you know, how the true players or the true uh, controllers are going to um, take that information. 
Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, for me, it was really, uh, there were two things that were really important. I did consider it uh, to, to, to uh, be one of the people at the party, but then first of all, I couldn't choose who. <laughs> and, and secondly, I thought, yeah, it's really, um, it's, it's nice if the player stays very close to, you know, maybe you don't have a Pikachu onesie, but you, we are all at home, especially now these days, a lot. <laughs> and then how, how amazing would it be that you get just, uh, you know, that you get this mystery envelope and, and, and are just somehow end up in this situation, like totally uh, disguised, but undercover. And, and then uh, the whole fact that this event was all about disguises and then having to unmask people uh, I thought it would be much more fun if you were mm. just yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I see in the in the Twitch chat that somebody's posting uh, Chris Lickman's "You Are Jeff Bezos," which I think is like an awesome example, uh, yeah. of, like the yeah. universe of this. And I I think for me, like what like writing this or designing this, like I guess to a certain extent, the way that I would answer that question too is like I know that Victor's an asshole, right? Like, or I know that like this person is like a bad person or that like I am morally abject to like their you know uh decision making right and like to a certain extent I just like didn't want to write that person you know like I didn't want to like play as that person do you know what I mean I think it can be like a super interesting space to design from but I I just like couldn't muster that energy maybe yeah. but that is a really nice game yeah totally absolutely <laughs> I, yeah no I like I would definitely say like a super good example of that yeah Mm. So maybe um, final question, if there's not more from the chat. So like maybe just in general, um, we've, we've already touched on like maybe also your like um, Nicholas, your, like your frustrations with, with some of the <laughs> directions in the, in the kind of more mainstream games and things like that. So I'm curious about, I guess, what types of games or what, what are directions that you see for games culture to to address the climate emergency further, basically, you know, mm. what what are things that you'd like to see more of, or that you're you're working on, or that that you can point us to where people can find more things that you're interested in in that area. Marlos, do you want to do you want to go first? <laughs> I don't mean to pass the buck. I'm I'm happy to go. No, I... no, it, it, I'm all, I'm not really good at like thinking on my feet <laughs> either. But no, I don't know. Yeah, um, uh, I don't have like a whole bunch of examples in mind at all. But I definitely, uh, I definitely hope to see more like games exploring. Um, uh, the actually, yeah, agency exactly. Mm. Uh, the fact that that the the thing that bothers me most is that. Uh, we are um, we are getting in real life. We are getting too much uh, blame <laughs> as individuals, mm. and um, uh, yeah, and politics and 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 industry are st are are still able to continue while uh, <laughs> we really need to do something fast. And uh, um, yeah, so I, I would love to see more games exploring this actual tension between. Uh, where the fingers are pointing, uh, not at changing light bulbs and recycling your your paper and whatnot, which is really great, all of it, and we should all do it. But you know that's not the main thing, and uh, we should not be distracted uh, yeah. so easily. So more about really expose, like using games maybe to expose real systems of power that are mm, <laughs> you yeah. know currently at play to talk about those and understand those better. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would, I would also say, like, to add to that, I 100% agree. And I, I would also say to that, like, to really think about the benefits of the communities that we're in, right? Like, games as, like, a medium is, like, has, like, so many people invested in it. Um, and I don't mean, like, financially invested, but I mean, like, dedicated, mm -hmm. right? Um, and really, like, want to see um, games, like, be, uh, like, elevated and celebrated and I think trying to galvanize those communities into some form of action um, or some form of like social progress is, is a really, um, I think, productive ends. And, and so I, I'm, maybe I'm not like looking for games to necessarily do this all the time, though I think that that it can be an, a great opportunity, um, but for studios and makers to really think about how they can be active participants um, in their communities uh, to, you know, 
uh, steer things in a specific direction. So um, whether that be like really thinking about like carbon, you know, uh, offsets of their projects or their products, uh, or there was recently like a, a far few giants did this like anti NFT uh, sale of animated gifs from their game that went to planting trees. You know, there's like ways in which you can kind of like galvanize your community or galvanize your support network or galvanize people that are interested in the stuff that you're making and kind of shift or bring that community into, uh, you know, uh, action of one kind or another. Mm. Um, so I, I definitely think that that, that is an opportunity um, uh, that I'd love to see like within games. Um, and to also just think about like, yeah, what, what kind of like uh, financial models can you create as an individual that then can go towards benefiting people that are really doing that frontline work? Cool. So maybe that's a good point to stop. Um, big thanks to both of you for this really interesting discussion and for uh, sharing the games with us. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, thanks also to the chat for um, giving us questions and watching. Um, we'll also be posting a kind of uh, survey, <laughs> not the last one, hopefully, uh, <laughs> like what you thought about the festival and you know what, what other topics or activities we, we might pursue. So if you have time and want to support us, uh, just fill that out, that helps us a lot. Um, and if you want to stay on, um, coming up in about 45 minutes is the next session, which has kind of a similar model. It's also going to be two games uh, that are somewhat related. Um, and these are both games that imagine kind of worlds where the damage has already been done. So this is a, a game about kind of <laughs> going way beyond repair or uh, kind of in a way also dystopia, uh, dystopian thinking, but like with a twist. Um, this is um, one game is Venice um, 2089, which is about um, imagining a, a Venice that is flooded. That's not a tourist destination anymore. And mm. um, playing the role of a, of a teenage girl that just kind of wants to live her life and that also can't, you know, do anything about the, <laughs> the flooding because it's already happened, you know, <laughs> and then and then what do you do? Um, and the other game, even in Arcadia, is uh, about a kind of, I would say, even <laughs> more evolved situation where um, yeah, basically capitalism has uh, gone even more extreme and is extending to kind of uh, throwing away planets or using planets um, as a kind of uh, single use <laughs> item basically. Um, so very cynical in a way also um, fitting with our topic of going beyond repair uh, today. So if you wanna watch that, just stick around. Uh, yeah, and thanks again for you, uh, for joining us. See you around. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.